Hey there, thanks for joining me. It's Emil from Nature's Light. If you've been following along, we're getting into our Capture One um, workflow at the moment. The last two were basically introducing what I thought about Capture One and then going forward, how do we ingest our images so that we can start working in Capture One. I'm now gonna start looking at a very basic edit so that users can understand how to change the highlights and the shadows and basically the central editing workflow that you would use with any kind of um, raw editor. Before I get started though, Capture One, in the interim of my starting the series of videos, has brought out an update. So we're now up to 15.3.1.15. Essentially what they did is change the layout a little bit, they neatened up a couple of points and they made it operate a little bit faster on the new MacBook M1s. But they did also ch move the cheese, so to speak, which means that some users who were working on the older, the older Capture One versions are going to find that the workspace has suddenly changed. The good news is that Capture always allows you the opportunity to change your workspace. So all you need to do is go up to Window, Workspace, and then you can shift between Default and Default Legacy, where Default Legacy is basically what the old Capture One would have looked like, and the new default is simply as such. Once the spinning beach ball of death ends, there we go, right. So what they have primarily done is rather than having a color tab, which you would have usually seen in the, the, uh, tab, the tabs on the left-hand side, now what they've got is color inside the adjust tab. So they just tried to streamline and minimize the number of tabs that you have to work through. Some users will prefer the old way, others will prefer the new way. You have the choice, which is great. Now, once you've got your images in, usually the first place people go to is to work out whether they can get rid of any lens corrections that um, need to be placed and get the color right so that the image coming in is true to what they would have seen on the back of their camera when they looked at the LCD screen. To look at the first thing, the color aspect, we'd have to go and click on style. Now, as with any raw editor, phase one, the originators of capture, have their own idea or recipe as to how an image should look. So what they've done is they've given, for instance, this is shot on Nikon D850, they've got a generic ICC profile and they've given it an auto curve. Same thing that you would find in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. To start off with, what you can do is hit, go ahead down to Pro Standard um, Profile uh, immediately. Now this is the closest I've found to accurate color so far. It's far better than the Adobe um, alternatives and it's as close as I can get by creating my own ICC profiles using something like a color passport from um, Spider. Don't listen to me, I'm being a Muppet. What I actually mean is the color passport from X-Rite. Okay, so the next thing is your curve. Now the curve is essentially just changing the contrast in the file. If you want to see what your camera captured, which is flat, you would go to linear response. It looks quite dark over here, but this is actually what your camera captured. It isn't what the curve is showing you captured. That's essentially the same as having landscape or standard or vivid when you use your color style in the camera itself. I'm gonna use film standard because I tend to work in that way, but if I wanted to see exactly what the camera captured, I would go into linear. Now correcting the lenses would come under shape. So essentially you'd go down to lens corrections and it usually picks up which camera lens you've used unless it doesn't have any electrical contacts. So in this case, it's a Zeiss Milvis uh, 18 millimeter lens and it's already automatically click the chromatic aberration to remove that but I can also just correct my distortion by dragging that out to about a hundred and light fall off now I think by pulling it to a hundred it's too flat I want to keep a little bit of that central uh, um, idea of looking into the frame so I'm just going to back off a little bit on the light fall off to around somewhere in the 40s or so. That's basically where we're going with that. Now, one of the nice things about this optical sort of tool as well is that it has a sharpness slider. And the sharpness slider basically improves the sharpness on the edges, which would have ordinarily been lost due to field curvature of the lens itself. So if you want to get your edges nice and sharp, you'd basically pull out your sharpness a little bit. And all it's doing is it's sharpening just the edges of the frame as opposed to the entire frame itself. Let's go into the adjust section, which is where we're gonna spend most of our time Time today. The adjust section is where you change your tones, your luminosity, and you work on some of your color. And it's 
all global adjustments. I refer to global, meaning that the entire image is affected, whereas a localized adjustment is one where you use a mask to identify a small portion of the image and work only on that. That's for another video in future though. Okay, so I'm gonna pull out my histogram so we can actually see it nice and big over here. And we're doing that so that you can see how the tones are affected using each of the sliders. Your exposure slider works much the same way as the exposure compensation in a camera. If I pull it to the right, adding positive, it's going to make the image become brighter. If I drag to the left, it's going to make it go darker. The one thing to be aware of though, is that because it's a treating every pixel the same, everything gets lighter or darker. And you can see, as I turn to the right, I was blowing out. Now these red marks here are because of the exposure warning up in the top right hand corner. Command E on Mac, Control E on PC if you want to show them or hide them. So I've got them shown at the moment and it basically indicates where I'm blowing out. That's what the exposure is doing. Now if I wanted to brighten my image without actually affecting my highlights, the slider to use for that is the brightness slider. What that's actually doing is it's taking the middle tones in your image, so this area here inside my histogram, and it's pushing them to the right or the left. So you'll notice that as I pull to the right or the left, my highlights are no longer affected as much. So I can actually get quite a lot more brightness into my image without blowing out my highlights. Okay, I'm gonna double click on the nub to return that back to default. Then I'm gonna look at the contrast. Now what contrast does is it increases the contrast in an image by darkening your darks and lightening your lights, or vice versa. It can reduce the contrast by darkening my lights and brightening my, da my darks. So if I bring my contrast slider out to the right, you'll see how the histogram has pushed outwards. So my brights are getting brighter and my darks are getting darker. If I want to reduce the contrast, it's the opposite. The brights, are, the brights are going to get darker and my darks are going to get lighter. Okay, so let's just reset that again. Saturation, it does exactly what it says. If you bring it to the right, it's going to saturate your image. If you take it to the left, it's going to desaturate your image to the point that if you push it all the way to the left, it's gonna turn it into a gray scale image. I've been double clicking on the nubs, but I can also just hit the reset button over here. So there we go, that'll reset it. The high dynamic range, what that's doing is it's only affecting the highlights or the shadows or your white point and your black point. Now let's start at the white point over here because this is often the way you would start in Adobe software. If I drag this to the right, you'll notice how the histogram pushes just the edges to the right until it starts clipping. And it's the same with my blacks, okay. Now, if I wanted to, I could use the levels curve instead to do the same thing. So I'm gonna reset those, pull out my levels curve, and you'll see that I've got these sliders. If I had just brought that in to my highlight point and brought my shadow line to my dark point, that's exactly the same as using my white and black sliders, or essentially it's like, it's like the same. So you can actually use two techniques to find your white and blacks, and it's a good place to start sometimes. So a lot of editors will actually start by finding a white point, a black point, and then changing their contrast and everything else after that. More important for us in, the, in this exercise though is our highlights and our shadows. If I take my highlight slider, you'll see how only the highlights are affected inside my histogram. So if I want to bring the highlights back in my clouds, for instance, over here, I just pull back. And again, in the shadows, I can bring up some of the shadows themselves to be able to adjust my tones. Let's reset everything again. I'm just gonna go up to the top bar at the very top and hit reset and we're back to ground zero. I'm gonna keep the histogram up so that you can see what's happening inside the image. And we're gonna start first off by playing with the color. As with Lightroom or any of the other editors, if I've got these two bars, the, the two sliders, the Kelvin slider is going to increase or decrease the warmth in my image. So move to the right for orange, move to the left for blue. The tint slider will slide it towards green on the left and magenta on the right. Okay, fairly simple. If you have a neutral color point, a white or a gray inside your image, you can also use the dropper tool. So I grab the dropper and then I can click it on something that I believe should be pure white and it'll set all of my white balance accordingly. You can also use the uh, drop down menu, which gives you a whole bunch of options. But again, these are baked by Capture One. So it's what they believe 
your uh, flash, sunny shot, etc., should look like. Okay, so let's reset everything over there. I am just eyeballing this, feeling that the image could be a touch brighter, or not brighter, warmer. So I'm going to take my warmth slider and I'm going to just push it up just a, a, a smidgen. And then I'm going to take my tint slider and I'm going to push it towards the magenta because the Nikon that I use, I find, tends to have a slightly greener cast. So I'm just going to push that across to the right just a smidgen. And there we go. If you're concerned that you haven't got this right, you can actually hit the before after button on the top right hand corner of the workspace. At the moment, I have it set so that it has the dual slider view, which is great because you can now slide it back and forth and you can see the effect that you've had on your image. If you want to see the whole image, you just use the drop down menu and go to full view. And that's it. So I can go before and after. Before, after. Okay, so I actually think, um, sorry, let me just go, there we go, and so I think that looks relatively good. I, I think I'm happy with that, with the color, in terms of the color that I'm working with. So now what I want to do is bring down some of my highlights so that I can see the detail in my clouds. I want to add a bit of contrast, and I want to lift my shadows just a touch while retaining the darks in the soil itself. So to do that, I'm going to bring up my brightness just a bit, there we go. You can see that's bringing up some of the lights um, in the midtones over here. I'm going to take my black slider. I'm pushing this back because I want to have the darks nice and dark in the, the, the dark soil over there. And I'm also going to just push my shadow up just a touch. There we go. Right. So it means that we're not really clipping anywhere yet. But my highlight slider does need to be used to bring back that detail in the cloud. Okay. I think still think you could use a smidgen more contrast overall so I'm going to bring that out bring my highlights back a bit a bit more over there and I feel that you can see that there's probably some highlights or brightest tones that could potentially come out to give it a bit more roundness so I'm going to take my white slider and push that out just a touch before we start clipping and there we go and again to see before and after we'll go before after before after Okay, probably a little too green still. So let's just take that. So, nope, no, I was happy with that. That was actually good. All right. And there we go. It needed maybe a touch more warmth. So remember, small amounts. You're not doing massive, massive changes. Okay, so that's basically it as a very, very basic start to the image. As a bonus, you can always just go down to your um, clarity. And in clarity, what that's doing is it's doing a global and sharp mask basically that brings out some of the detail inside your image so you'll notice that if I push my clarity to the right everything gets crunchier for want of better words and if I pull it to the left everything gets a little bit smoother okay this has a lot of detail in the image so actually I don't think it needs clarity a lot of people end up using it whereas you don't actually need it so I think I'm going to probably leave it at zero. So I'm going to ignore clarity and we'll come back to that on another occasion where it probably makes more sense to use that. What I am going to do though is I'm going to crop my image. So let's bring this back into the panel on the left and we're going to hit C for the crop tool. You can also access it using the toolbar at the top over here. It's under the crop tool. Your crop tool by default set such that you always have the same aspect ratio as the aspect ratio that you shot in. I personally prefer something other than 2x3, so I'm actually going to go in and rather than having original, so I right click on the screen and up comes the tool tab for the crop tool, and I'm going to go to unconstrained. Okay, now using unconstrained, I can actually bring this, let's just get this up here, there we go, right. So I'm wanting to re get rid of some of the detail at the bottom there, and I want to bring this out just to that level of clouds over there. There we go. Maybe bring it in a touch on the edge. There we go. And for some reason, this crop tool is, there we go. Let's just do that. Right. Okay, I think I am happier with that as a view of my image. And there we go. And then I still feel that to center one's attention into the center of the frame, I'm just going to go down to a vignette at the bottom of the adjust panel and just bring in a very slight vignette over there. Okay, there we go. So to get your before and after, we'll see the split view slider. And that's it. My before and after. 
Okay, so that is a very, very basic idea on how you can use some of your basic sliders. In a future video, we're going to come back and we're going to look at layers because layers is one of the reasons that Capture One is such a good product. And we're going to look at how we can mask and use localized editing. We're also going to spend some time in color corrections and color balance because, again, this is why Capture One has such a devout following amongst some of its users. If you enjoyed the video, you found it useful, drop a like in the bottom corner if you'd like, and also don't forget to subscribe uh, to the channel. You'll get updates as to when the next of these videos is going to drop. And until then, I hope to see you on the flip side. Cheers and thanks for watching.